Hi, Mike and Valerie. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. Hi, Teresa. Good to see you. You too. Now, as we know, cybersecurity technologies are always advancing and they have to manage the immense amount of data that's required by AI-based cyber solutions. So I'm looking forward to our chat today about how edge computing can enhance cybersecurity. So Mike, first, let's start with you. I'd like to know, uh, um, tell me about your partnership. You're a Rockwell Automation technology partner. Tell me about how that works and how it benefits the customers. Yeah, so Stratus simplifies edge computing for Rockwell's connected enterprise with unique fault tolerant computing platforms that deliver the highest level of application availability. And we know for cybersecurity, that's really important. You don't want that system to be down that the cybersecurity software is running on. The Stratus platforms are known for very fast deployment, uh, operational simplicity, uh, which allows OT personnel to maintain computing in remote locations. You know, not everybody has IT skill in every parts of their plant or in these remote locations. So being able to simply uh, manage those assets is important. Um, our uh, platforms are sold globally through the Rockwell and the Rockwell distribution system. Um, Stratus has been a technology partner and participated in all aspects of the program for over two decades. And we work with the entire ecosystem of partners, including cybersecurity companies. And Valerie, maybe you can give us the lay of the land on the current cyber threat landscape. What are the most pressing cybersecurity threats facing firms engaged in manufacturing, production, and facilities and utilities management? Well, that is a great question because of most um, recent events, everybody is keenly aware of ransomware and that is at the forefront of, of everybody's mind because it has made national news a couple of years ago. Um, but there are also additional ways that, um, you know, um, our infrastructure is being attacked as well as, you know, manufacturing and, and utilities and all kinds of, of other operational technologies. So those are also including things like, you know, um, IoT devices, they are particularly vulnerable. Um, there's insider threats, which are extremely difficult to detect um, and prevent, um, as well as phishing attacks. Of course, I mentioned what's always top of mind, which is ransomware. Um, but beyond that, it is um, what I think is, is the most insidious is the simple um, ability that uh, a lot of the threat, um, threat actors now are out to just get into your network and simply collect data. They want to know more for longer. Um, for what purposes, we don't always know, but um, it's a it's a it's a ever expanding landscape of of threats that we're having to mitigate and and fight against. It's almost like um, industrial firms need to be thinking about it's not if we're attacked, but when. It's getting and to that, that has level. been the ideology, you know, it's not yeah. if, but when, but I will say having been to very remote, you know, upstream and midstream sites um, and, you know, out in West Texas, it is kind of a mindset shift to look around at a desolate landscape at a compressor station where it doesn't look like, oh, my camera just got blocked. I'm sorry about that. Where it doesn't look like anybody has been in three months, much less would want to attack from a ransomware or any kind of other perspective. It just doesn't seem like it would be on the radar, but it is. Yeah, absolutely. So how can manufacturers and other firms deal with these cybersecurity threats that you just described? So the way to deal with the threats is to obviously, like you were just talking about, take on the ideology that it's not if, it's when. Um, but it is a, a large undertaking, right? They probably already have cybersecurity, um, you know, um, plans and, and implementations and controls um, from their organization that have previously been implemented, but operations is a little bit of a different animal. Um, and so deciding how to implement what may or may not have been working in, in IT over into OT is a discussion because it is previously not something that OT, meaning operational technology, has previously had to entertain. They're about you know, doing whatever it is they do in operations and they do that very well. So it has been a little bit of a, a, a discussion about who has ownership of that. Is IT coming in to implement security measures in OT or is OT gonna take on that responsibility with IT's approval? 
um, which doesn't always work well either. I've seen large enterprise level organization approach it from both directions. Some have had a lot of success. Others have sort of gone through an iterative process of trying to figure out how to tackle it. And it isn't just who has ownership, but what should be deployed in the field at different types of sites, what should be deployed along the manufacturing floor at different points along different, you know, types of control systems or, or technologies that could be leveraged, you know, what is what is the risk profile of those various technologies and, you know, how do you assess, it's a large undertaking, how do you assess how to best protect your particular organization? And a technology that's on everyone's mind is artificial intelligence. So how can AI be integrated with existing OT security technologies and processes to provide a comprehensive defense in depth strategy? So IT is extremely effective in terms of incorporating IT is uh, uh, AI. I think I said IT and I meant AI, but <laughs> IT, I just did it again. AI is extremely effective in being able to mitigate some of the um, some of the um, mitigate some of the threats that we see happening. It's already incorporated into a lot of um, detection ware that we're seeing leveraged at the edge, but it is also conversely being used as a, a weapon against us in terms of being able to more effectively mimic human behavior. So to some extent, the AI that we're deploying to protect ourselves is also um, been weaponized to use against us. Right. So considering all of this, and it seems like a lot, <laughs> What are some recommended best practices for improving uh, a company's cybersecurity posture? Well, we've long, we've had a few longstanding models that we could follow, which, um, you know, the Purdue model is extremely well known, extremely well respected and recognized as a, a go to. If you follow the steps in the Purdue model, um, you will have covered all your bases. But there's also some new ones that have come out that have been very, very positive, um, one of which is the um, uh, MITRE attack um, process that you can that you can follow. That's an open standard, um, and they do have one specifically for um, industrial control systems. So that is, you know, essentially more specified than the Purdue model to specifically address these types of of attacks. And when doing that, how can companies balance security measures with usability and productivity? So that question really is centered around, well, how about we back up a minute? What sure. is the absolute best way to secure your company? Well, the most secure application that you can apply or the way to, to securely um, make sure everything is to secure is to simply shut it down and not let anybody touch it. That is the only way to guarantee it's 100% secured, right? Well, but now it's of no use to your business. So I'm using that as an extreme example to talk about what it actually is in a realistic way is a conversation about risk. How much risk can this site, that site, this particular um, you know, plant or manufacturing organization or wastewater treatment facility, how much risk can they actually handle relative to having a direct impact on operations. Because if you're too shut down and too controlled, you're going to have a negative impact on your ability to produce. Hence, you have to have the, the conversation about what is your risk profile. And that is becomes an equally large conversation because it can be different at various uh, levels of your organization and wholly different from what uh, opera, uh, IT has decided their risk profile should look like. Right. So. We talked about AI earlier. How can AI be used to enhance threat detection and response in OT environments? So in, in leveraging OT environments, it's important to know who is in your environment, who has access to it. So there's lots of AI built into access, command, and control. And that it hasn't typically been deployed out in the OT space simply because you haven't had the compute power and you haven't had the ability to economically deploy those types of, of, of security measures. Now that we're seeing advancements in one, the need, we need to have cybersecurity out there. We've already pretty much touched on why that is, is readily apparent um, at this day and age, and that's only growing. But we're also seeing advances in computer technology in terms of the ability to host multiple applications at a reasonable price point 
at the edge, out in these remote locations and facilities where it makes it feasible um, to leverage different types of cybersecurity that has AI built in that we can take advantage of. So, Valerie, when we think about key takeaways from this conversation here, what immediate steps can manufacturers take to improve their OT cybersecurity position without significant investment or disrupting their operations? Well, I would think once you have the risk profile identified, that will tell you what sites you need to address first. Once you have those sites addressed, obviously you wanna look at what can I get done the quickest. What can be done the quickest is to leverage whatever is currently potentially working in your IT environment. But again, you would need to deploy it in your OT environment. And how, how would you do that? Well, you would have to leverage compute power. So from our perspective, the quickest way to um, be able to implement these security measures would be able to leverage server class compute power out at the edge, which would allow you to um, virtualize a number of your automation processes along with your security application deployment. So once you've done that, you've done a lot of things there. You've got some workload consolidation. You have increased your reliability and your resilience. You've moved your security posture all the way out to the bleeding edge of your environment. And you've reduced the number of devices you have out in the field if you aren't having to have an application and a, a a, a computer to run it on, application and an IPC, application and IPC. If you're able to consolidate all of that into fewer devices, it's a win, win, win. You're more secure, you're up and running more, and you've done it at a price point that's reasonable. That makes absolute, absolute sense. And I think it's, it's good advice for someone to move forward. So it's very useful information um, that I enjoyed talking and learning about. So Mike, what's the best way to get in touch with someone at Stratus? Yeah, so we want to make this easy for the, the listener to contact Stratus. Um, contact information is listed in the podcast description for me and Valerie. Please reach out to one of us. And if we're not the right person, uh, we'll direct you to the right person at Stratus. Cool. That's a, the best way to do it. And I appreciate both of you being here today to chat with me. And this is very good information. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thanks, a pleasure. Thanks, and thank you to our listeners for listening. We always appreciate you spending your time with us, and you'll find those useful links in the episode description. I'm Teresa Hauk with The Journal Magazine, and we'll chat again soon.